This sound file contains the spoken version of the Wikipedia article on the Algiers Putsch of 1961. The material was recorded on November 29, 2017. The Algiers Putsch of 1961 from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia at en.wikipedia.org. The Algiers Putsch, also known as the General's Putsch, was a failed coup d'etat to overthrow French President Charles de Gaulle and establish a military junta. Organized in French Algeria by retired French Army Generals Maurice Schall, Edmond Johaud, André Zeller, and Raoul Salon, it took place from the afternoon of April 21st to April 26th, 1961, in the midst of the Algerian War. The organizers of the putsch were opposed to the secret negotiations that French Prime Minister Michel Debray's government had started with the anti-colonialist National Liberation Front. General Raoul Salon stated that he joined the coup without concerning himself with its technical planning. However, it has always been considered a four-man coup d'etat, or as de Gaulle famously put it, quote, a handful of retired generals in retreat, unquote. The coup was to come in two phases, an assertion of control in French Algeria's major cities, Algiers, Oran, and Constantine, followed by the seizure of Paris. The metropolitan operation would be led by Colonel Antoine Argaud, with French paratroopers descending on strategic airfields. The commanders in Oran and Constantine, however, refused to follow Shal's demand that they join the coup. At the same time, information about the Metropolitan phase came to Prime Minister Debray's attention through the intelligence service. On April 22nd, all flights and landings were forbidden in Parisian airfields, and an order was given to the army to resist the coup by, quote, all means, unquote. The following day, President Charles de Gaulle made a famous speech on television dressed with his 1940s general uniform, ordering the French people and army to help him. Section 1. Context. The majority of the French people had voted in favor of Algerian self-determination during the disputed referendum of January 8, 1961, organized in metropolitan France. The wording of the referendum was, quote, Do you approve the bill submitted to the French people by the President of the Republic concerning the self-determination of the Algerian population and the organization of the public power in Algeria prior to self-determination, unquote. French citizens living abroad or serving abroad in the military were allowed to vote, as were all adult Algerians regardless of ancestry in a single electoral college. Speaking for the provisional government of the Algerian Republic, Ferhat Abbas called for a boycott of the referendum, as did 16 retired French generals and factions among the French settler community opposed to independence. Self-determination was approved by 75% of voters overall and 69.5% in Algeria. The government reported voter turnout of 92.2%. Other sources claim that 4 out of 10 of the individuals in France and Algeria entitled to vote abstained. Following the outcome of the referendum, Michel Debray's government started secret negotiations with the GPRA. On January 25, 1961, Colonel Antoine Argaud visited with Premier Debray and threatened him with a coup directed by a colonel's junta. The French army was in no way disposed to let the French Algerian departments created in 1848 after the 1830 conquest become independent. Section 2. Chronology On April 22, 1961, retired generals Maurice Schall, André Zeller, and Raoul Salon, helped by colonels Antoine Argaud, Jean Gardès, and civilians Joseph Ortiz and Jean Jacques Soussini, took control of Algiers. General Schall criticized what he saw as the government's treason and lies toward French Algeria colonists and loyalist Muslims who trusted it, and stated that, quote, the command reserves its right to extend its actions to metropolitan France and to reconstitute a constitutional and republican order seriously compromised by a government whose illegality is blatant in the eyes of the nation, unquote. During the night, the 1st Foreign Parachute Regiment, composed of 1,000 men and headed by Ely de saint Marc took control of all of Algiers' strategic points in three hours. The units directly involved in the putsch were the 1st and 2nd Foreign Parachute Regiment, the 1st Foreign Cavalry Regiment, and the 14th and 18th Regiments of the Chasseurs Parachutists. Together, they comprised the elite units of the airborne divisions of the French Army. Initially, there were pledges of support from other regiments, the 27th Dragoons, the 94th Infantry, the 7th Algerian Tirailleurs, and several Marine Infantry units, but these seemed to have reflected the views of senior officers only, and there was no active participation. The head of the Parisian police, Maurice Papon, and the director of the Sûreté Nationale, 
formed a crisis cell in a room of the Comédie Française where Charles de Gaulle was attending a presentation of Racine's Britannicus. The president was informed during the entracte of the coup by Jacques Foucault, his general secretary of African and Malagasy affairs and closest collaborator in charge of covert operations. Algiers' population was awakened on April 22nd at 7 a.m. to a message read on the radio, quote, the army has seized control of Algeria and of the Sahara, end quote. The three rebel generals, Shal, Jahoud, and Zeller, had the government's general delegate, Jean Moron, arrested, as well as the national minister of public transport, Robert Gouron, who was visiting, and several civil and military authorities. Several regiments put themselves under the command of the insurrectionary generals. General Jacques Faure, six other officers, and several civilians were simultaneously arrested in Paris. At 5 p.m. during the minister's council, Charles de Gaulle declared, quote, Gentlemen, what is serious about this affair is that it isn't serious, unquote. He then proclaimed a state of emergency in Algeria, while left-wing parties, Communist Trade Union, CGT, and the socialist supporter, NGO, Human Rights League, called to demonstrate against the military's coup d'etat. The following day, on Sunday, April 23rd, General Salon arrived in Algeria from Spain and refused to arm civilian activists. At 8 p.m., President de Gaulle appeared in his 1940s vintage military uniform on television, calling on French military personnel and civilians in metropolitan France or in Algeria to oppose the putsch. Quote, an insurrectionary power has established itself in Algeria by military pronunciamento. This power has an appearance, a quartet of retired generals. It has a reality, a group of officers, partisan, ambitious, and fanatical. This group and this quartet possess an expedient and limited knowledge of things, but they only see and understand the nation and the world distorted by their delirium. Their enterprise leads directly towards a national disaster. I forbid any Frenchman and first of all any soldier to execute a single one of their orders. In the face of the misfortune which hangs over the country in the threat to the Republic, having taken advice from the Constitutional Council, the Prime Minister, the President of the Senate, the President of the National Assembly, I have decided to invoke Article 16 of the Constitution. Starting from this day, I will take directly, if the need arises, the measures which seem to me demanded by circumstances. French women, French men, help me." Unquote. Due to the popularity of a recent invention, transistor radio, de Gaulle's call was heard by the conscript soldiers who refused en masse to follow the professional soldiers' call for insurgency and in some cases jailed their officers. The putsch was met with widespread opposition, largely in the form of civil resistance, including a one-hour general strike called by the trade unions the day after de Gaulle's broadcast. Within the army itself, much depended on the position taken by individual senior officers. The 13th Light Division of Infantry, responsible for the strategic Zone Sud Orienis, including foreign legion units, followed the lead of its commander, General Philippe Ginestet, in remaining loyal to the government in Paris. Gina Stett was subsequently assassinated by the OAS in retaliation. On Tuesday, April 25th, government authorities in Paris ordered the explosion of the atomic bomb Gerbio Verte in the Sahara as part of a scheduled testing program. Gerbio Verte exploded at 6.05 a.m. While the test and test site were already prepped as part of the French national nuclear program, the test timeline appears to have been accelerated to ensure that the security of the device was not compromised. The few military units which had followed the generals, progressively surrendered. General Schall gave himself up to the authorities on April 26th and was immediately transferred to metropolitan France. The putsch had been successfully quashed, but Article 16 granting full and extraordinary powers to de Gaulle was maintained for five months. Quote, the battle of the transistors, unquote, as it was called by the press, was quickly and definitely won by de Gaulle. Section 3. Casualties. The only known fatality was French Army Sergeant Pierre Brilliant who was killed by the putschist while defending the radio transmitter at Oled Fayette, Algiers. Berlint was aiming at 1st Foreign Parachute Regiment 3rd Company Captain Estoupe when he was shot by a legionnaire. Section 4. Trials and Amnesty The military court condemned Schall and André Zeller to 15 years in prison. However, they were granted an amnesty and had their military positions restored five years later. Raoul Salon and Johod escaped. Salon was condemned in absentia to death later commuted to life sentence, as well as Jahoud. Salon and others later founded the OAS, a terrorist paramilitary organization that attempted to stop the ongoing process of the April 1962 independence EVN agreements 
for the Algerian territories of France. A July 1968 act granted amnesty. The November 24, 1982 law reintegrated the surviving generals into the army. Raoul Salon, Edmond Jahoud, and six other generals benefited from this law. Section 5. Controversy around CIA and BND allegations. There have been publications in France, first in Tout Paese and then in Le Monde and Le Express, stating that individuals within the CIA supported the coup. The rumor allegedly spread by word of mouth originating from minor officials in the LC Palace itself. The officials apparently told reporters, quote, to understand that the general's plot was backed by strongly anti-communist elements in the United States government and military services, unquote. In May 1961, Le Express published an article stating, quote, both in Paris and in Washington, the facts are now known, though they will be never be publicly admitted. In private, the highest French personalities make no secret of it. What they say is this, the CIA played a direct part in the Algiers coup and certainly weighed heavily on the decision taken by ex-general Schall to start his putsch, end quote. Only two days before the Algiers putsch, the CIA had indeed staged a failed coup in Cuba against its leader Fidel Castro, known as the Bay of Pigs invasion. In what some allege a cover-up, U.S. President John F. Kennedy contacted de Gaulle to pledge his support, including military assistance if needed. President de Gaulle declined Kennedy's offer. There were other claims of foreign support. French journalist Patrick Pesnot contended that the French generals also had the support of the West German Federal Intelligence Service leader Reinhard Gellin. However, General Schall himself always contended that he had never been in contact with any foreign countries in this affair. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0 unported license, available at http colon forward slash forward slash creativecommons.org forward slash licenses forward slash by dash sa forward slash 3.0